said, fill me up until I overflow. I want to run over. I want to run over. So fill me up till I overflow. I said, I want to run over. Run over, oh, fill my cup, Lord God. Do mighty works in me, God. I want to run over. Oh, see, love of God. Cups, Lord God, we're empty vessels without you, God. Oh, we need to move in your spirit and not by our brain. Oh, sin, love of God, overflow in us, God. Oh, fill me up, God, because only you provide the fire, God. Oh, you provide love, God. Say, fill me up, God. Oh, fill us up, God. Say, fill me up, God. Say, fill me up, God. Because you provide the fire. Come on, lift your hands today. Come on, come on, come on. Said, I'll provide the sacrifice. Oh, oh you pour out your spirit. Oh, and I will come on, worship up him. Say, fill me up, God. Be up, God. Oh, fill us up. Time. Come on, lift your hands, lift your hands. Oh, fill me up, God. Oh, fill me up, God. God, we love you so much. Come on, lift your hands. How many of y'all love God today? Come on, come on, come on. I know it's hard. I know it's a rough time. I know it's a rough time. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you who had, a, who had a rough time. All of these teenagers. Everybody in here can remember your graduation. You can remember prom. You can remember all these things, right? But all these teenagers here, guess what? They missed all of that. But guess what? Till I overflow. So come on, you can do better than that. If they can get up here and they can push through all the disappointment they have been through, then I know out there you can lift your hands. So one more time, I want you to worship God. Now let's go, go, go. Set through me up. Set till I hold up love. Till I gotta run over. I wanna run over. Oh, fill me up. Said I gotta run over. 
This is our prayer today. Fill me up, God. Fill me up with what? Kindness? Fill me up with what? Love, not hate. Come on, lift your hands. We want God to fill us up. So we're running over, not running on empty. Father, we love you. Father, we love you so much. Come on, lift your hands. We love you so much, God. We thank you that today, Father, we can see, Father, as we look around this room, we know that today, Father, the plan of the devil has not worked because we are not divided. The plan of the enemy has not worked. Come on, I told you a couple weeks ago, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God, Jesus, comes to bring life. And part of him bringing life is bringing togetherness. The world out there can be divided by color. The world out there can be divided by money. But in here, we all, we all are seen by God as the same. Come on, give Jesus a shout today. God sees us all the same. And, and listen, listen, and I get it, I get it. You can look at people's faces and, and people are disturbed. We had a conversation this morning, didn't we? It is tough out there right now, but you gotta keep your eye and keep your eye focused on what's real. A kingdom that is divided, it cannot stand. And right now, the enemy would like nothing more than to divide you. Divide you by fear. Older people, oh my gosh, I'm going to get coronas. Younger people, oh, I don't care. Divide you by color, black, brown, white. But in here, this is where it starts. In here is the experiment. Because let me tell you something. Everybody sees God differently, but God sees us the same. Everybody sees God. Everybody has a different view of God, who God is, what God's going to do. But God sees us the same. So if he sees us the same, then on Sunday morning, it should not be the time when races are divided. On Sunday morning should be the time that somebody can come together and say, what matters is your heart, not your skin color. So look around. Just look around. Look around today. Look around. This is how church should be. And until the church figures that out, they are going to never figure that out. So come on, give Jesus a hand clap and give God a shout. Come on, come on, come on. Somebody's got to do the right thing. Now, I want all the fathers to lift your hand. All the fathers in here to lift your hand. Father, I pray a blessing on each father today. I thank you, Father. We have our heavenly father, which is you. And I thank you for all these earthly fathers that are here today. I thank you for those and I pray for those that have lost their father, Lord God, that they will not have a hard day today, but a day full of good memories. Father, some of them don't even have good memories of their father. So that's okay. They still have you. They still have you. And you have been there for us through thick and thin. But I want to pray today that every father in here is blessed, that they are blessed going out, blessed coming in, that they are blessed in the city, that they are blessed, that their hands are blessed, their jobs are blessed, their families are blessed, their children are blessed, their finances are blessed, God. In the middle of all this chaos, bless these fathers for being present. They are present, God. And that is what is so important today. I thank you, God, for your message coming forth today that it will encourage us and lift us up on this Father's Day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, come on, give God a shout. Okay, all right, now, because of all this nonsense, you got to give somebody an air hug, so just turn around and go like this. Say, don't touch me. Don't touch me. 
Brooke, next week, let's have MC Hammer. You can't touch this. We'll, we'll play that. Amen. Come on, how's everybody doing today? Everybody good? Come on, give God a shout. Come on. Come on, wake up, wake up, wake up. Y'all just sleepy? Look, if you sleepy, come to the 1230 service. All right? 10 o'clock is like, <sighs> all right, we want to welcome you today to Abundant Living Family Church High Desert where we have passion for God and compassion for people. Amen? We want to tell you today, I know we're not handing out a bunch of cards and different things, but if this is your first time here with us, we do want to recognize you because we appreciate that. If you are a visitor here for the first time, would you lift your hand today? If you said, whoa. Oh, whoa. Charlie, I'm going to resist everything in me. <laughs> this is my friend and his family today, and I'm so thankful that they are here with us today. Anybody else today brand new? Anybody? Anybody see? See, how you doing? What's up? He's like, what's up? <laughs> He's all cool with it. Amen. So we love you. We thank you. God for you coming today. Um, we are a multicultural church. That means that our church looks like heaven. I tell you that every single week. Uh, there should not be a black church, a white church, a Hispanic church unless your whole community is black, white, or Hispanic. If you go to Home Depot and if you go to Stater Brothers and you see all kind of different people, that's exactly who you should see in church. Come on, somebody. And I'm going to say it, it's not popular, but I don't give a crap. How about that? It's important. And so I'm thankful that everybody can come in here on a Sunday morning and we can practice for heaven, Johnny. How about that? We're practicing. Come on, look at your name and say, we're practicing. We're practicing for heaven. All right. Well, obviously it's Father's Day and we are so thankful for that. So we have a special Father's Day video for you this morning. No matter how old we are, we always remember what our dads say and do. My dad is more like Jesus than your dad. Nuh-uh. My dad doesn't let anybody eat any food until we pray for it. My dad prays for one minute every day. You know what? Our church has pancakes. This is what my sister and mom use for their blush. My dad says that mean kids never know what they're talking about. Because their parents don't know what they're talking about either. My dad says to punch meanies in the face. Then my mom says, don't ever do that. And my dad goes to time out. <laughs> <laughs> my dad's beard is itchy whenever he kisses me. My dad takes me to church so we could learn to be just like Jesus. My daddy prays for me. Then he makes me stop talking and go to bed. Then I get a flashlight and read my comic book. That's a sin. He's sinning. No, I'm not. Sinner. No, I'm not. R2, R2, R2. My dad said that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. My dad never stays mad at me. My dad taught me to forgive, because Jesus forgives us every time we ask. I want a mohawk. I wish I had hair. It's OK. Your hair will probably grow back. Thanks for being our dads for all our lives. <laughs> all right, no hair jokes. Don't look at me. Don't look at me like that. All right. I am so excited today. Um, this is such a dear uh, friend of ours, family friend. Um, you guys, he's not a, he is not a guest. He's on our board of directors. But more than that, he and Cheryl Salem have a worldwide uh, ministry where they travel around the world helping people and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We had booked this a long time ago, and we thought it was so important. He is a father of fathers. He's got so many products out there. You can check those out later. But he wrote a powerful book called The Orphan Generation, and he spoke to the issue of fatherless. So without further ado, I want to bring up our special guest speaker for today, and it is Pastor Harry Salem. Mark, how are you all today? I am so honored to be here today. Uh, this is my first weekend out um, since March 12th. 
um, as we are traveling ministers, evangelists, and um, so my wife and I, how many of you remember my wife, Cheryl, from the ladies' meetings? Yeah, um, you know her personality, so that's why I have gray hair, because for the last 90 days, she's like, I got to get back out there with everybody. And so she's in Fontana today ministering, and so it is an honor to be here with you, especially on this Father's Day. And um, I know you already mentioned the fathers here and the children, but um, my, my word today is for the whole family. Is that all right? Because um, I'm, going to, I'm going to do teaching more than preaching. Is that all right? Because our people have been preached to death. But I need to share with you what the Lord has done for me. And if I tell you how I've lived, it might help you to have a better life. But if I just preach to you, anybody can come up here and preach a word because they can open the Bible. But I want to share my life with you. Is that all right? I was 10 years old and my father, uh, actually I was 9 years old, my father was diagnosed with leukemia. And be, by the time I turned 10, my father graduated on to heaven. Now, my father was a Middle Eastern man. He was a, a United States Marine, and he was a Golden Glove boxer. If my, whoa, if my dad said take out the trash and the can was empty, you better throw something in the can and take it out so you didn't get a whooping. That was, it was yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. We had structure in our home, so my father was a perfectionist, almost to the point where it could drive you nuts. But we need more of that in society today. Instead of just accepting, well, the average or the adequate, or I'll do just what I can. No, you do what it takes is the attitude that we've got to have. So my dad instilled that in me, but at the age of 10, my dad went on to heaven. And this is what my father said to me. He, it, it, the, 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 the Saturday before my dad went to heaven, I went in there and I, I went into his hospital room and he knew his time was short. He could perceive it. And he said to me, he said, son, I want to just give you a couple of words in life. Number one, do not ever trust anyone in your life. Now, you know, that's a great word. But for me at that time, that meant I can't trust you because you're going to hurt me. But the Lord spoke to me later in life. He said, yeah, your dad was right because when you trust people, they will let you down. He said, you've been trusting people and loving me. You got it backwards. You are to love people and trust me. So be careful where you put your trust and that will help you put your faith because man will let you down. I felt my dad at 10 years of age let me down because he died and left me. He didn't choose to die. It happened to him. But when you take a tragedy, you can take a tragedy and turn it into two things, hate or help. You take the things in life and you call them a tragedy and then you can either say, I hate. When our daughter went to heaven at six years of age, I could have sat there and said, I hate the tragedy. I hate that my daughter went to heaven, and I could have been filled with anger. Instead of that, we began to have a ministry of help to help people who have gone through the same thing. See, you get a choice. Don't let anybody ever dictate your future to you. They can direct you, but you have to decide. Let me tell you how bad it got for me, and, and, and I wrote this down because while I was sitting there, I want you to grab one thing right now. And if you have a pen and paper, I'm going to give you some, some notes. Because this, this will help you throughout the week and throughout the month. But I want you to write this down because I think this will mark you in your mind. This is what the Lord gave me for you. Old ways don't open up new doors. You want me to say it again? Old ways don't open up new doors. Which means if you think you can still do the old thing and you're going to have new things come before you and fulfill those things, you're not going to be able because you're doing it the old way. The Bible says this one thing I do, I forget the former things. You know, have anybody seen that movie, um, Men in Black? Do you, do you understand when I tell people you can be born again and the Lord Jesus Christ can take your former life, your sins, and forgive them, cast them into the sea of forgetfulness, people look at me and go, 
ain't no way he can forget what I did. Do you know in the men in black, we can accept the fact that a guy will take a pen and flash their light, and everything that they had before them will be forgotten. We put more trust in a movie than we do in the Father. Okay, so let me tell you how bad it was for me. And I wrote this down because if my wife was here, she could tell you all my flaws. But I'm going to help her while she's not here because she's probably watching me. So uh, at 10 years of age, all of a sudden, I found myself in my mind as an orphan. Anybody believe they're like an orphan without a father? Do you know Satan was an orphan? He had no father. So, so I, I said to myself, I'm an orphan, I don't have a father. One of the very first things I found out at 10 years of age, that anger, that rage started to come up in me. And I want you to know in the word, the Hebrew word for anger, it means without fathering. Old, ancient Hebrew. So this anger came up. The dentist put me in the chair, and he was beginning. I was 10 years old, and he started to work on me. He said, now, son, you need to sit still. I got up, and I told him, you're not my father, and I hauled off and cracked him. And I hightailed it out there. He's come running after my mom, uh, after me out the door. And my mom said, what's going on? He said, your son just punched me. Well, what would you say to him? Because my mom saw it. But she didn't, I don't want to say did. She couldn't do anything about it. Well, the next thing you know, I'm 10 years old. And my baseball co coach comes up to me. And, and, and he says the same thing. Now, son, you do. And I hauled off and cracked him. I said, you're not my father. I am an orphan. I have no father. You ever feel that way? I go into my first day of high school, 10th grade. I don't even walk through the front doors, and the counselor meets me there, never has met me before, never said anything to me. I'd never said anything to him. He looks at me and said, well, boy, I can tell you this. You are not going to make it through my high school. Oh, my goodness that anger just kept coming up in me and that kept coming up in me and kept coming up in me and that, that hatred kept coming up in me. And so what I did, I was driven by hate and anger at that moment. And I said, I'm going to prove him wrong. See, what he did was, and you write this one down, he had an opinion of the outside package. He never looked at the inside potential. He had judged me by the way I looked and had no idea the potential that was in me. But the Bible says when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, you become a new man. My mom couldn't change me, but the Spirit of the Lord could change me. We are going through life thinking as men that we can do everything without God. You can do nothing without God. Change comes when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you. And yet, guess what? It isn't a head change. It's a heart change. We have got to have a heart after God and not man. I was outside, and I don't know the gentleman's name, but when I pulled up, he, he just went beside himself when he saw me coming in. He said, I'm so excited to see you. I'm so excited. It took me back for a minute, and I told him, thank you. And he said, you know, I love you. I love your son. He's, he was uh, working in the court, and it excited me so much. You know what? When did we wake up and tell the Father, I'm so excited to see you today? I, I, you know, mo, you, you know what men want for Father's Day? 71% of men want for Father's Day? A steak dinner. A steak dinner. Go figure. A steak dinner. You know what I want for Father's Day? I brought them with me. Where did I put them? Grandpa, where'd you put them? Grandpa, where'd you put them? Did I leave three cards down there? I did. No, there's three. In. Where did I put them? What I wanted, I was going to show you, and I brought them with me. Grandpa's dropped them somewhere. I'm getting seen out. So, what I want, are, and I, oh, they're in my Bible bag right there. What I want is a card from my children. And my children, I have my cards right here. Why do I want cards? From they ask me, Pop, what do you want? Pop, what do you want? Pop, what do you want? Now I'm called Papa. I'm Papa. On my bracelet on my hand, I have Papa. Let me tell you something. If I was to ask you to describe yourself in one word, what would it be? I want to be Papa. You want to be Papa. 
I said, all I want for, for my Father's Day is a card. And they said, but Dad, you know, we're supposed to bring you a gift. I said, the greatest gift is when I read your cards, you're communicating with me, and I know how you feel. Let me tell you, the greatest gift you can give to your Heavenly Father today is communicate with Him. Because He wants to know how you're feeling today. And let me put it to you this way. I praise the Father in the morning for what He's done for me, but I worship Him because I want Him to know who He is to me. He's not someone just to give you a hand out. He's there to give you a helping hand up. I want you to understand. I don't want to give you a hand out. I want to give you a helping hand up because I want you to understand the Father. So uh, I, I brought this just for you this morning because most men want to know, why are we here? What are we doing here? Why were we created? So I brought this for you this morning. And I hope you enjoy it. And if you don't, you have no sense of humor. So. So why are we here? On the first day, God created the dog and said to the dog, I want you to sit all day by the door of your home and bark at anyone who comes by or walks past. For this, I'm going to give you a lifespan of 20 years. The dog said, that's a long time to be barking. How about only 10 years, and I'll give you back the other 10? Dog sounds like my wife, negotiating with God. So God agreed. And on the second day, God created the monkey and said, Entertain people, do tricks, and make them laugh. For this, I'm going to give you a 20-year lifespan. The monkey said, Doing tricks for 20 years, that's a pretty long time to perform. How about I give you back 10 years like the dog did? And God said, Okay. On the third day, God created the cow and said, You must go out in the field with the farmer all day long and suffer under the sun, have calves and give milk to support the farmer's family. For this, I'll give you a lifespan of 60 years. The cow said, That's kind of a tough life you want me to live for 60 years. How about 20 and I give you back 40? God again said, okay. And on the fourth day, he created man. And he said to man, I want you to eat, sleep, play, marry, and enjoy your life. For this, I'll give you 20 years. But the man said, only 20 years? How about is it possible that you give me my 20, the 40 the cow had, the 10 the monkey gave back, and the 10 the dog gave back, that would be 80 years. How about that? And God said, okay, you asked for it. So that's why for the first 20 years, we eat, sleep, play, and enjoy ourselves. For the next 40 years, we slave in the sun to support our family. For the next 10 years, we do monkey tricks to entertain the grandchildren. And the last 10 years, we sit on the front porch and bark at anyone who walks by. I'm entertaining my grandbabies now. And I'm almost to the point where I'm barking at everybody who comes by. They say statistically that, uh, that a man who ha has seen his father grow older, I'm not, I didn't get to see my dad grow older, but a man will begin to resemble his father beginning at the age of 37. So now if you start saying or doing things and you say, man, that sounds like my dad. Boy, that I did something like my dad. Trust me. You're at 37 years of old. I've watched my son who's 30, and I'm watching him do the same things. My little grandson, we were watching the movie the other day, and I don't know if any of you do this, but you have that kind of shaky leg. You know, my wife hates it in bed. She goes, stop shaking your leg. I don't even know I'm doing it. Well, we were watching the movie the other day. My grandson sitting in my lap, and all of a sudden, his little foot's just going like that. His, my my daughter-in-law, she looked at me and said, Papa, see, I told you he's just like you. You can't help yourself. It's in you. But you cannot pick who your parents are. You cannot determine how you got here. But let me tell you, you have a choice on how you leave here. It's not as important on how you get somewhere. It's as more important how you leave that place. You go in and you apply for a job and you put on your fanciest clothes and your hair's all combed and, and you look good and you're articulate and, and you get the job. And then the next thing you sit there and, and, and you work for five or six years and all of a sudden you don't like the way the company's going or anything else. And you storm off and you write an angry letter and, you're, and you, you talk bad about every. Let me tell you what they're going to remember, how you left, not how you came. I remember how my dad left. It was cancer. I had a great man one day talk to me because when my daughter left this earth, cancer had riddled her little body. She went from a 37-pound little blonde-haired, blue-eyed little girl to 97 pounds because of all the cancer treatment that was in her. The last vision I had of her was that. And he said to me, you cannot talk about how she dies. What you need to talk about is how she lived. See, I want to talk about how you live. 
because when we leave here you're going to be described by one word when you get to heaven well done my faithful son that's the word from the Lord or I don't even know you that's a determination you have to make see on my tombstone there's going to be a day I was born there's going to be a day I die but in between there's going to be a one inch dash mark engraved in my headstone forever do you know what that one inch determines your entire life can come down to one inch because that's how you lived your life when my children stand over my grave should the Lord tarry all I want them to say is Papa I don't want to talk about the houses, the cars, the boats, the success, the fame. Because when I get to meet my father, he's going to describe me as one thing, my son. One word will describe your life. So, if you have pen and paper, I'm going to give you a few things. If I can, I get my notes here. So, I did write a book called um, a Rise of an Orphan Generation. And I want you to know something. I am not an orphan. I am not an orphan. I found my father. And my father says he'll never leave me nor forsake me that I can trust him all the days of my life, that I am created in his image. See, you cannot let someone else tell you what they think of you because how you look. Because my father says when you look in the mirror, it's a mirror reflection of that I created you in my image, my likeness, my greatness, my ability. When I began to get that, I didn't see a kid who had hatred in him. I saw a son who had a father who always told me I could and let me show you the way because I've given you a roadmap and it's written in 700,000 words. It's called the Word of God. So anybody want this, Pastor? It's the rise of an orphan generation. If someone could just hand it out, if you want to come and grab it. I wrote another book. It's called For Men Only and I'm going to give it to a woman because women are so curious they're going to want to know why is that just for men? So if a lady would like that, can I give that away to somebody there? And then we're living in a situation that fear has gripped us. I'm going to be wise, but I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to be wise, but I'm not going to be afraid. So we wrote this. It's a 40-day journal on overcoming fear. If you're walking in fear right now, this is a journal that every morning you get up and you begin to pray it. And Mark, I don't mean to ask the pastor to do that, but if you'd like to be blessed with that. Okay. Okay. Are you getting anything so far? Okay, don't be quiet on me. If my wife was out there, she'd be correcting me. So, um, I want you to understand um, my definition of a father. My definition of a father is one who always gives and never takes. Now, wait a minute. What does that mean? I'm talking about my heavenly father. One who gives and he never takes. You think somebody said to me well you know the Satan won and he took your daughter's life he doesn't have the authority to take my daughter's life my heavenly father received my daughter to heaven you listen if you listen to other people if God has called you to do something and he's spoken it into your heart when he said to me on uh, sitting in that sofa he said you need a transformation you need a change in your life I was on a blue sofa watching a television at 2 30 in the morning and I looked at it and I said I do not like how the family is represented and let me tell you if you complain to God and you have your ears open in your spirit to hear he's going to talk to you and let me tell you he's not going to tickle your ears he's going to challenge you l- 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 let me tell you something um Stress can either destroy you or good stress can challenge you. He put it on me that night. He said, then get up off of that sofa and do something about it. The very next day, I left the job that I was doing, and my wife and I began this family ministry. So I want you to understand, I I got alone with God. Jacob got alone with the Lord. Jacob had a lineage of of, of ancestors in, in faith, in ministry. But his own mother tried to cheat her other son out of his birthright and give it to Jacob. Now you talk about a mom who was setting the course for this kid's destiny. She taught him at birth to cheat. So guess what? He lived up to her expectations. They called him a swindler, a cheater, a deceiver. And the next thing you know, Jacob finds himself 
with nobody wanting to be around him. I mean, if you went into a restaurant, people would say, get away from him because somehow he's going to take your lunch. <laughs> Don't do business with him because he's going to make money and you're going to lose. He's going to get the gold, you're going to get the shaft. So he found himself at a place where he looked in the mirror and he said, I don't like what I see. It's like a goldsmith. Goldsmith takes the gold, heats it up, or a silversmith, to where it gets so pure he can see his own reflection. When the Lord begins to purify you, you look in the mirror and you don't see your earthly self. You begin to see a mirror reflection of the Father in the mirror. That comes from purification. Jacob said, I need to get rid of the old man. I need to become the new man. So I, how do I do that? I need to be cleansed by the Father. So he began to wrestle. The Bible says he wrestled with an angel of the Lord. It wasn't an angel of the Lord because the angel of the Lord didn't, in, in the word of God, a, a angel is not capitalized. The only thing that's capitalized in the word of the Lord is the deity. If you see him and it's capitalized, they're talking about the Father or the Son. The angel was capitalized. So guess who that was? It was Jesus. So he got along with Jesus. And this is what Jesus said. Turn me loose because daybreak is coming. In other words, he said, listen, Jacob, you have tried this before and before and before. And I am tired of dealing with you and I don't want anything to do with you. You never want to hear the father or the son say that to you. But Jacob said, I am not going to turn you loose until you bless me. At that moment, the Lord knew something had transpired in Jacob. And he said to him, we shall call this place Peniel. For I perceive the Lord has dealt with you. He has marked you. He has changed you. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob. But he said, it shall be called Israel. And this is what he said. You shall have power with God and with man. You want power? Get alone with God. Have a transformation in your life. And now you get power with God. And you can have influence over man. Without that, it's just you. And let me tell you, I can't cure cancer. But the Father can remove it from your body. I, I, I can't help a hurting, dying world. But my Heavenly Father can save them. Now, uh, so, so that was the story about Jacob. Now, let me give you this, if you're writing it down. Father, let's take the word father, F-A-T-H-E-R, and I should have sent this to you for, to put up on the big, I like that big board. I've never seen that before. I just, yeah, it's new. I like that. And my name's up there. Hey, thank you. It usually says Miss America's husband, but now I got my name up there. So, Father, let's take the first F, Father. You know what? The first F in Father should be faithful. The word in 2 Kings 6, 16 and 17 says, so he can open his eyes to God's provision. Let me tell you, that's a giving God. We, and as a father, we can take that and understand we're supposed to be a giving father. So he's faithful. He's always there to show the way. And then the next one, F -A, a, a, t a, attentive. You know what? I, I love that because attentive. In Job 32, 11 it says, I waited for your wise reason and I paid attention. In Acts, the crippled beggar oh, had only one thing to give in life. What did he do? He gave his attention. And at that very moment, he began to get healed. And he left his place of despair, and he got into the temple, and he jumped, and he left because his life had, life had been transformed. How many times do our kids say, hey, Dad, would you come out and play basketball? Hey, Dad, would you come and do this? And you're sitting there with a video game in your hand. He said, I'm too tired. No, you ain't too tired. You're too lazy. At that moment, you didn't become a father. You became a sperm donor. You were there to make it, but you can't take it. Now, I'm not admonishing you because guess what? Old ways don't open up new doors. So attentive. Pay attention. And let me tell you something. Be careful who you pay attention to. The Bible says that you can get wise counsel. Don't be listening to some jarhead. Because most people don't want to let you change for the good. They want to keep you in the bad. Because they don't want to take the effort to become a new person when you have given your effort to become a new man. 
I, integrity and intimacy. Integrity. You to show yourself approved. There's one book has been written in Christendom about integrity. How I had it, how I lost it. Shame on us. Integrity is gained through a lifetime, but it can be lost in one instant. Intimacy. If you're, if you want to know what the Father is saying to you, guess what He says. If you want to know my secrets, you need to what? When someone tells you a secret, listen. And how close do you have to be? We have to be so close to our children and so intimate that we don't assume what they're saying. We hear what they're saying. Dad, did you hear me? Yeah, I listened to you. No, you listened, but you didn't hear me. And the only way to hear me is to turn your phone off, please. Turn your television off, please. Put the remote control to the video game down and listen. And that's what the father says. You know, there was an old story about a man that got born again, and he didn't have anything. And he said to the Lord, he said, Lord, if, if you can provide for me, if you'll save me, if you change my life, he said, I'm going to spend every morning for an hour with you, and I'm going to talk with you, and I'm going to receive from you. And the man did that, and then he got a job, and then he got a better job, and then he got a better job, and then the next thing you know, instead of an hour, it was 45 minutes, instead of 45 minutes, it's a half an hour. Now he didn't even do it because he had the pressures of life, the payments on the house, and everything else. And then one morning, he got up, and he looked in the room as he passed by to get run out to the car, and he saw the chair that he used to sit in where he communicated with the Father every morning. And he stopped, and he sat back down for a moment. He said, oh, Lord, I have missed my time talking with you. And the father spoke to him. He said, not as much as I've missed my time with you. Your father wants to spend time with you. Dad, listen, everybody says it's, it's about quality time instead of quantity time. If you don't spend with your time with your children, someone else will be. Trustworthy. The Bible in 1 Kings says promises are fulfilled. The Lord, every promise he, he makes is yes and amen. And here's my word to you. Don't make a promise to your child that you know you can't fulfill. Because then comes disappointment, and then they lose their trust. Then they stop paying attention. Then they're not, they have no faith in you. And guess what? This whole thing works together in the whole thing about a father. F-A-T-H-E-R-H, honorable. The word in Hebrew says, the word honor means to open the door. When you open the door to communication with your children, guess what? They're going to honor you all the days of your life. It's all about communicating. And this is what a great scripture, get it. 1 Kings 3.13 says, I have given you what you have not asked for. Isn't that like a father? Don't, doesn't anybody like surprises? Don't, don't you like a surprise? You come home and your wife's got a, a surprise for you in the table. Your children got a surprise for you. He wants to surprise us every day with something that we haven't even asked for. We're too busy asking him for, to pay our car payment when he said, I want to give you a brand new car paid for. We limit God. We limit God. He says, I want to bless you. E, enthusiastic. How do you, listen, I know some of you are working two jobs. I mean, I, I worked Friday night, I worked all day yesterday, and, and I'm here today. And I had to get up early this morning, drive an hour and a half to get here. Why am I enthusiastic? How do you become enthusiastic? The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, it says, we are energized by faith. Stop taking those energy drinks, they won't help you, but your faith can energize you. <clears throat> and guess what? I don't know how much those drinks cost, but... It don't cost nothing from the Father. And guess what? He never runs out. Your future grows with the amount of faith you apply. Last one is righteousness. Blessed is the man who lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, but walks in the teachings of God. And a righteous man walks in his integrity, and guess what your reward is? He is blessed and envied and are his children. I want to give you a statistic. In the last one, and we'll talk about that later, but F-A-T-H-E-R-S, you got to be saved. You got to be saved. 
I'm driving here, I turn on my radio, I'm listening to a preacher on the radio, and I don't mean to be critical, but when anybody says you don't mean to be critical, really you are being critical, so I don't know how to say it in any other way. But he gave an altar call, and if you didn't know as a preacher that it was an altar call, it had passed you right on by. The Bible says you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You need to ask the Father to forgive you of your sins. He takes out that little pen light and he flashes it, and everything you did before is gone, and everything you do now is new. Remember what I said to you in the very beginning. Old ways don't open up new doors. I'll give you a statistic. You like statistics? Because I like to prove things. Men like things proven. I like to prove it. My wife used to tell me, I said, oh, prove it to me, prove it to me, prove it to me. I, 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 you know, she said, I'm a good cook. Prove it to me. <laughs> 35 years, she's still trying to prove that to me. You know what she says to me? And you, some of you don't know, my wife's a former Miss America. I mean, she's beautiful. And she says, look, I can either look this good or make you dinner. I said, call Domino's. Anybody can make a pizza, but to look like that. So if a child gets born again first in the family, there's a 3.9% chance the rest of the family will get born again. If the mama gets born again first, there's a 17% chance the rest of the family is going to get born again. But if the father gets born again, there's a 93% chance that the rest of the family gets born again. Guess where household salvation starts? with Papa. You, and, and I know some of you sitting there, my dad was a rat. I mean, he was just horrible. He was a turd. He left me. And I mean, I mean, I know you all are thinking that because some of you are. But let me tell you, he did one thing right. He gave you life. He put you on this earth. And it wasn't at his choice. It was at the choice of your heavenly father who said, I'm going to use him to be the vessel to bring you forth. And what you do after that is up to you and me, not him. The way to salvation is you give yourself to him. You entrust yourself to his keeping. And it says, and thus your whole household shall be Say, Mark, how much time am I supposed to have? It's 11 o'clock. 11.30. Okay, so did you get that? F-A-T-H-E-R. Did you like a little bit of it? Let me tell you why I'm doing this for men. Men want headlines. Men want, want sayings. Um, Nike says, just do it. I did. I just did it. Just do it. You remember snippets. I'm writing a book. It's, it's going to be 60 psalms in 60 days from Papa. Papa Psalms. 60 things that I've learned over 60 years, I'm going to put it down. And, and what I'm going to do is if you give me a minute a day for 60 days, I believe you can change your life. The, 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 the men have proven that if you do a routine for 21 days, you can change. 21 days. 21 days. 21 days. 21 days to change your life for eternity. That's what the world says. But the Father says, if you just give me one second, change your life and not in 21 days I'm going to change you instantly so here this is what I, I, I like the Bible says that love validates faith do you know that your love validates faith so the more that you grow in faith the more love that you exude some people say well how do I get faith you don't get it you got it what do you mean I don't believe. I don't care if you don't believe. Some people say, well, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. God said it whether you believe it or not, and it's settled. So it has nothing to do with what you believe. It has to do with what you do with the faith. Because the Bible says I've given each person the measure of faith, even as small as a grain of mustard seed. One of the cheapest things you can buy in the grocery store is a jar of mustard, a dollar. I mean, that's what the dollar store charges. Walmart has it for 99 cents. They don't put a lot of value on that, but look at the Father said. That which the world does not value, I entrust in you, and it can change your life. 
we discount what the Father has put in our hand and say that's not enough. No, he's given you more than enough. So here, so love, L-O-V-E, love. What is love? Love is legacy. The Bible says that grandchildren are the crown of old men. Guess what? My two grandbabies, I, 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 I can't tell you. You know, it's a hard day for me today, but it's a great day for me today. I'm kind of like the guy that, you know, is on the teeter-totter. It's a great day because I saw my grandchildren, I saw my son, my daughter-in-law, my wife, and I'll see my other son after this service, and, and I got to see my grandbabies, so it's a great day. But it's also a hard day because I don't get to see my daughter who's in heaven. But it doesn't mean I can't talk with her. See, the only... I'm going to say that for later. Love, legacy. So God says to me, after 17 years, you never held a little gr little girl in your arms after your daughter went to heaven. He's a loving, restoring God, and he never forgets. It might take time, the Bible says, though it tarry, wait. The word wait in the Hebrew means to twist, to turn, to, to dance, to intertwine. What does that mean? You don't just wait there for your miracle with that look on your face and being angry with the Lord. He says, you need to dance before me because the joy of the Lord is your strength. My wife can't make me happy, but the joy of the Lord can change my life. She wasn't put on this earth to make me happy. She was put on this earth to be my helpmate because I need help. I hope you're watching, honey. L-O, opportunity. You're only going to get one chance in this life. Don't miss an opportunity to influence. You only get one opportunity. Well, I'll catch that the next time around. You know, I, I, I came up here a few years ago, and, and, and on my way home, um, they had the road blocked off, and somebody was running across the street to get a, a hamburger, and they got hit by a car. Well, you know, I'll do it tomorrow. He didn't have tomorrow. I was driving home a Friday night, and on my way down the Interstate 10, I had traveled and I was got off of my exit. Well, right behind me, I had no idea what was coming, and I'm sure these people didn't. But they went down three more miles, and next thing you know, their car overturned, and three people or two people were killed, four people were taken. They had no. Your opportunity is now. 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 Don't put off today the things that can make a difference for tomorrow. Everything I have in, in my life today is directly tied to what I did yesterday. How many of you woke up yesterday and said, Lord, I want to thank you for the breath of my body, food in my stomach, house over my head? What if you woke up today and all you had was what you gave him thanks for today? Where would you be right now? The virtue. It's a race, the Bible says, looking for one virtuous person. Do you know he said, if I can find one virtuous person in Jerusalem, I'll change their outcome. One, You know why virtue is so hard? Because it's so hard. It, we're in, inundated with things that take us away. We're inundated with things every day that want to keep you unrighteous. Inundated. Is it your fault? No. It's only your fault if you succumb to it. We, we blame the devil for everything. No, sometimes you're just stupid. Your wife's mad at you because you put all that money into a car with the wheels and the steering. Listen, wives, I want you to understand that only a man would buy a $500 car, put $2,000 with the wheels and a $1,000 stereo in it. You're never going to figure us out. But to us, yeah. <laughs> eternity what do you get to take with you to eternity you get to you get to take something to eternity you don't get to take your body because you become a spirit you don't get to take your house your car you don't you, you don't you, you, what do you take to eternity the only thing you get to take to eternity is what you leave behind that's your legacy Everybody today is talking about their legacy. Legacy isn't given. Legacy is lived. What you get to take to eternity is how you lived your life. Listen, our daughter went home at six years of age. 
And someone came up, you know, the Bible says that with long life they shall satisfy the Father. So I guess that they didn't have long life, should not satisfy the Father. You know, I'm Middle Eastern. I take you out. I'll take you down. Don't talk about my daughter that way. But it made me question, well, Lord, did she fulfill her life? She's six years old. Went to my pastor. That's why it's important to be in church and having a godly man lead you. So I went to my pastor. And he's younger than I was. But I said, da-da-da-da-da. And he said, this is what the Lord has for you. It's not how long you're on this earth, but it's what you do and the amount of time that God gives you. If you got breath in your body today, God can use you. And I want you to understand something about eternity. The other day, and I'll give you a few more things. Getting anything yet? You okay? I'm going to wake you up. I'm going to have to make you run around this building. Man came to my door. My air conditioning broke. You came to our dinner at our home for the pastors. My wife and I like to have the pastors to thank them. They come and I bring in people to teach them and help them. So maybe it'll encourage them because you know one of the loneliest jobs in the world is being a pastor. When you wake up every morning and you get to pray for me for a heart attack, pray for me my child died, pray for me for brain tumor, pray for me. You just want to hear once somebody send you a note saying, I got born again. We hear so much of the bad we, th we thrive on the good. But let me tell you, if the bad gets you off, the good's going to get you off. If people's criticism will get you off, people's accolades will get you off. Stay focused on the Lord. So we try and stay, keep them focused on the Lord. So the air conditioning had gone back bad. And so this man came to my house, and he, he fixed the air conditioning, standing in my living room, and I was getting the check to pay him, and he began to cry. And I'm looking at this guy. I said, did you get hurt out there? Make a long story short. He said, no, my my daughter got to go to the university where the dormitory was named after your daughter and she stayed in your daughter's dormitory and for four years her life was transformed he said and that's where she met her husband and he said she wanted to stay in your daughter's dorm because she knew her legacy and her history he said you changed my daughter's life I said I didn't change anything but my daughter's legacy is still changing people's lives. Because what you take to heaven is what you leave behind that will impact another generation. Well, I appreciate that. All right, I'm not going to keep you long today, but I want to give you just a couple other things. Um, of course, you know, fathers, we have to figure it out. <laughs> um, how, many, how many of you all have children? Raise your hand. How many dads taught their kids how to uh, play ball, basketball, baseball, football, anything like that? Well, I, I was a good athlete. I wasn't great, but I was good enough that I had potential for college. But that's not God's plan for me. And so I thought, if I'm good, then my sons are going to be great, right? I mean, that way we all think we all want our children, when they're born, they, we look at them and go, man, they look, look just like me. They bald-headed. I mean, and let me tell you, I'm thankful they don't look like me. I'm so thankful they look like their mom, Miss America. I mean, they're gorgeous boys. But I said, I'm going to make sure that they're athletes. So I, I, we all did this. We buy a baseball glove. We buy a basketball. We buy a football, right? And so I bought all those things. And so I, 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 my one son, and, and my wife was worse than me. My one son got out there in, in, in baseball, and uh, they were supposed to run from one sideline to the other. And my kid is like seven days behind everybody else. I mean, he just like. And I'm looking at him, and I looked at my wife, and I go, that's coming from you. That has, that's your gene pool, and it's shallow. It is not my gene pool. And so she, the, I mean, she won Miss America. There's only been like 80 of them in the world. She didn't go to Miss America to make friends. Miss Congeniality was out the window. She went, her motto was kill them all, take the prize. I mean, this woman is, so she starts screaming, gotta move on, pick up your feet. My wife can't run across the room. She has no athletic ability at all. I, 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 you know, I mean, I mean, we're so different. I, she said to me, she said, I just pray, because she's a singer, I pray my son has perfect pitch. I said, honey, I just hope he hits the ball. I don't care if he pitches or not. And, and, and we, so we're different. And she's screaming, and finally the coach came over and said, ma'am, we're to, here to encourage the children. We're, we're not here to beat them down. 
So they made her go out to center field and stand. <laughs> so afterwards, I mean, I'm just fit to be tied, and I'm blaming my wife and my son. I said, you, you couldn't run. You couldn't catch the ball. You couldn't hit the ball. What's the matter with you? You have Pop's genes. He said, well, Dad, you never taught me. How about communicate? So I learned from my older son that I was not going to make that mistake with my next son. So he was two. And I bought him a baseball glove. And instead of buying a soft baseball, I bought a baseball. Yeah. And he will tell this in men's meetings because he preaches now too. Make, you want to make sure the sins of the father will be brought forward. And so I said to him, now put your glove right here. And I'm going to throw the ball, and you catch it. Guess what happened? Y'all are laughing. He's, he's, he couldn't see the ball coming, so he moves his glove. It hits him right in the mouth, and he's got a fat lip. Papa hit me! Papa hit me! Papa hit me! My wife said, what in the world were you thinking? Well, I wasn't thinking he'd move his glove. Because if you move your glove, you're going to get hit in the mouth. Why didn't I say, put your glove over here and I'll hit it? That's the way we are in life. We make mistakes. Stop holding your father's mistakes against him. There's, there's, there's no formula for being a good father. It, it is a journey. It is an exploration every day. The Bible says that every day will have new challenges of itself. Every day. And I, I want you to understand, my oldest son, you've seen him. Both my boys, they're six foot plus, 220 pounds. They, they, do, they, they weight lift. They, they body build. They train. They are big guys. I don't, I don't want to run into them in the middle of the night because they'll break something in Papa's body. I mean, I went and played basketball with my son one day, and, and he hit me, and I came home. I'm standing in the shower. I can't breathe. And Cheryl said, are you all right? My son's coming around. I said, don't tell him. He said, Dad, you all right? Yeah, fine, 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 fine. He turned around. I collapsed in the shower. I mean, you don't want to show your weaknesses to your kid, but let me tell you, these boys are big boys. They're strong boys. They could have played, well, Roman played football, basketball, baseball. Harry could have played football. But one day he came to his mom, and he said, Mama, I, I want to sing the national anthem at the basketball game. My response was, you're built like a linebacker, and you don't even know the national anthem. You don't even know the words. What's the matter with you? are five years old. I want to be a linebacker. He wants to sing. Next thing you know, Mom said, well, I'll teach you the words. Next thing you know, if you've ever heard my son sing, our son sing, he has this big baritone voice. He's had it since he was five years old. And it's at five years old, he sang the national anthem, in a nationally televised basketball game, and the announcer said, we can't, we, we need to take a pause because if this is the future of our country, we're in good shape. He had this gift. What did I do? I looked at the outside package and not at the inside potential. Now, my wife began to train him because she's trained professionally. So I said, okay, I don't know anything about music. I, I, I you know, I sit at the piano. And I say, give me a cake. Ka -ka -ka -ka. I have no understanding of, of music. So she puts him in this uh, talent show. And there are kids from his little age of five to 18, 19 year old girls that are going to be in pageants. So he just comes out in his little suit and he just belts out this song. And, it, and we're just like, the crowd is going wild. And it, so they're ready to give out the first, second, and third place awards. They gave the first place to some girl who acts absolutely had no talent whatsoever. They gave the second one to another person that absolutely had no stage presence whatsoever. And then my kid pulls in third. And I'm like, all right, he's on the podium. My wife was not pleased. And then a woman, now my daughter was alive at that time, so I had the three children. After that, a woman had come up to my wife. Now my wife, you need to understand, if she didn't go to Miss America, she was going to Juilliard. That's her background. And so this woman came up and said, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I know that this is your son. And she said, you know, if you let a professional like me train him, he wouldn't have done so bad. If 
my wife's head could have spun around it would have spun around she looked at this woman and I said wait a minute I said children come on this is not going to be pretty and Gabrielle starts to turn back and I said don't 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 look back don't look back <laughs> and all I could hear is, why am I saying that to you because we have some single moms that have to be fathers too my mom had to be a father the scripture says he will be a father to the fatherless and a husband to the widows and the orphans my heavenly father gave us everything we needed right here in this book and he gives it to us so that it will help us make the journey of life and fatherhood better now i'm going to close with two things and and i hope you really like these but um, i want to give you this one at one year of age dad is the whole world amen i mean i saw your grandbaby looking right up at you papa and i was like ah right we're the whole world at five dad knows everything i mean we do it's broke dad can fix it my granddaughter wife papa can fix it papa can fix it mama says papa can fix it she comes in and you know i'm trying to fix it right i'm thankful for a glue gun and super glue i mean papa can fix anything at 10 dad's really cool that's my dad that's my dad look at my dad you want to dress like him you want to look like him you want to act like him you want to talk like him at 15 dad ain't cool he definitely not cool and look at the clothes that dad's wearing and lord help him with that hairline i mean come on at 20 dad doesn't know anything <laughs> y'all are you know what i'm talking about right it's, dad he just don't know anything at 25 what in the world is dad thinking I mean, when we get to a certain age, they give us a license to drive a 40-foot motorhome when our eyesight's going bad, our hearing's going bad, and our reactions are, are not there. That is the stupidest thing that they could ever do is give an old man a license to a 40-foot RV. And your kids are going to go, what are you thinking, Dad? But at 30, they start to think and they say, maybe I need to ask Dad. 35 maybe I should ask dad first at 40 ask dad he knows everything at 50 what am I in the world am I going to do without my dad that's the succession of life so you don't have to be angry at them at 15 when they don't want to have anything to do with you but you have to be there for them you have to be there for them there's a story about an Olympic runner. And he was a little baby, just about like his age right there. And the kid could run like the wind. By the time he was three, he was just tearing it up. So dad began to buy him tennis shoes, and began to buy him shorts, and began to see that he could excel in track. And as he got older, he was winning ribbons. And then by the time he got in grammar school, and then in high school, he was winning trophies. And then by the time he was in high school, he was winning awards and getting scholarships. And the Olympics were coming up, and the next thing you know, the kid, they came to him and said, we believe that you have an opportunity to make the Olympics. Long story short, he made the Olympics. They're now, and this was pre-11, 9-11. They were at the Olympics, and the dad's in the stand, and the kid's on the blocks, and he's getting ready to run the race, and he takes off like a shot. And as they're coming around the last lap, and they're coming around, he's leading the pack, but something happened, and the boy behind him caught the back of his shoe, and he went down. The boy behind him went down. The boy behind him went down. And then all the rest of them that shouldn't have been first, second, or third were now going to be on the podium. And he laid there in a crumpled pile. And he was in tears and he was hurt. And all he had going through his mind was, I failed. I didn't win. Everything that I've worked for is gone dad hopped over the fence and he picked him up and began to run the rest of that leg of the race with him in his arms and he crossed the finish line and the boy said to dad dad I'm so sorry that I didn't bring home the gold for you everything that you and I have worked for everything that you did for me everything that you put in me and the dad looked at him and said son you didn't win the medal but you won my heart he said, because we started this thing together and we got to finish it together. And that's what your Heavenly Father says to you. 
He's equipped you. He's given you. He's trained you. And all of a sudden you fall. The Bible says a righteous man can fall seven times and still get back up. And the Father says, I just want you to finish this race with me. And so we need to learn how to pray to our Father. And I'm down to my last ten minutes. I hope you're riding with me. So the last ten minutes, I want you to understand something. Most men have never taken their child's hand and prayed with them. Most men don't take their wives' hands and pray. The women do the praying. They do the praying. More women come to church. But we want to be head of our home. So if you don't know how to pray, I'm going to teach you how to pray. Because I want you to understand something. You're not alone if you don't know how to pray. Because the disciples said to him, Father, teach us how to pray. We've walked with you. We've been with you. We've seen what you do, but we have no idea how to pray. We don't know how to communicate. And the Father said, when you pray, in Luke 11, 2, if you want to follow it, you can, but if not, write it down. He says, I teach you how to pray. And this is how it goes. Are you ready? Our Father. Not my Father. Not your Father. Our Father. Guess what? The very thing that our Heavenly Father said is, I include everyone. Everyone. Young, old, good, bad. I include everyone. There is no exclusion when it comes to me and my children. Every human that walks the earth, he says, if you just say, our Father. And then he goes on, he says, who art in heaven? Heaven is our home. Where you sleep at night is your house, but heaven is your home. And it's in our future. Heaven is a real place. If you have a child or a loved one that's gone before you, heaven becomes so real to you. They've just changed an address, but they haven't ceased to exist. Our Father, who art in heaven, because he has a home for you. Hallowed be thy name. What does that mean? Holy is the name of the Lord. It should not be taken lightly. It should not be taught in vain. Holy is the Lord. Thy kingdom come, he says. I have a future for you. Because if you keep doing it the old way, it will open the new door. Thy will be done. What do we do on earth? When you get in a jam, you get in a tight situation, or you have to correct your children. You never correct your children in anger. You correct them in love. The Father says, what do I do? He says, thy will be done. You only do what you see the Father. He's a giver, not a taker. On earth as it is in heaven. You can't take earth to heaven, but we can bring heaven down to earth when we pray. And give us this day. We're only promised right now. Never miss an opportunity. You could be walking across the street. God forbid. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus is the bread of life. He said, I've given you something, now partake of it. He's given us 700,000 words. It's called the Living Bible. It'll bring life to you. And forgive us of our trespasses. He says, I'll forgive you in an instant, and your past will be forgiven daily. As we forgive those who trespass against us, the Bible is very clear. It says, if you have ought against a brother, leave your gift at the altar and go make peace with him. He says, if you want me to forgive you, there's a step you have to take. You need to be forgiving of others. And lead us not in temptation. It's coming at you from everywhere, but you wake up in the morning and say, Lord, lead me away from temptation because he's the only one that can. For thine is the kingdom. That's the future. The power which he gives to you. The authority when you walk in his name. And it says forever and ever and ever and ever. It'll never cease. That's how you pray. That's the love. And that's a father. Are you ready?
you ready to change? Some of us need to change. Because right now, as Pastor Mark said, with all hell breaking loose in this world, scientists have no answer. They have no answer. People have no answer. But the Father has an answer. So if we want to stop doing things the old ways so we can open new doors, how do you change? Because some people say, I can't enter into my mother's womb a second time. How do I be born again? I can't. I, I, went, I came from there. You can't put me back there. How do I change? Anybody ever studied science when they were a little kid and they said, this is a scientific miracle and they take a caterpillar who was birthed on this earth to crawl on the lowliness in mankind's kingdom. Crawl. But it, the Lord said, I'm giving you an example on how to change. If I can take a caterpillar and I can make it into a butterfly, how can I do that? The lowliest of lows, how can I make it soar to the highest of highs? The lowliest of lows to soar in the heavens. He said, if I could just get that, that, that caterpillar to go and get alone, he said, I'll form a cocoon around him. And while he's in that cocoon for three days I, I began to change the molecular structure of that caterpillar and when he comes out he now soars in the heavens with me how does he change you gets a hold of you changes the molecular structure inside of you and he said you don't have to crawl anymore you can arise and soar with me forever and ever and ever. Where no one notices a caterpillar, but everyone can see it. Close your eyes for a moment. Because of what we have with this thing, I normally ask people to join hands with somebody or not. That's to your discretion. But I want to pray for you. If you have never ever had a born again experience listen you can have a bible you can have a cross around your neck you can work in the parking lot you can you, you, you can acknowledge that jesus christ was the son of god but there's a difference it's called an intimacy with the father it means that you have a born again experience that your life is transformed and you have a personal relationship with him and if you've never had that personal relationship that i'm talking about how do you have that personal relationship you crawl up on his chest and you whisper in his ear and then he begins to tell you the secrets of your future and he says all those things you used to do i forget and i forgive and let me lay out before you what I have for you. You no longer have to crawl on the bottom of the earth and settle for the scraps from the table. I can make you soar in the heavenlies and have the first fruits on all the trees. Or maybe you have acknowledged him, but life and times and things have beaten you down. You haven't been a good father. You've been an absentee dad. Or as I said earlier, you were there at conception, but you're not there at the reception. If you want to change your life right now, put away the old and let God change you into new. In a few moments, I want to pray for you. Now, this is what happens in church. It's why I ask people to join hands and squeeze the other person's hands because so many men are, I don't want to slip their hand up. And most people think, well, he's just trying to count numbers. My Bible says that the angels rejoice when one gets born again. If you want me to pray for you for the transformation of your life so that you can soar and rise above the hell that we have on earth, slip your hand up there or place your hand on the shoulder of your wife or your child but in your heart if you want me to pray for you all you have to say is yes Lord 
the Bible says it's a simple gospel. Lord, take me. Lord, change me. Lord, make me anew. Before you got the word Lord out of your mouth, he began to transform your life. But now there's a prayer that I want to pray over you and with you. And if you'd like to pray it with me, I'd ask everyone in the house to pray this. Let's pray. And pray it like you mean it. Like that man who met me at the door and he was so excited. This should be exciting. Because what you do today affects the next generation tomorrow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, come on now. Heavenly Father, I declare that you are Lord of my life. I'll never be the same. I turn from the old and I go to the new. I leave hell behind and I look to the promise of heaven. I'm now born again and I have a father in heaven who loves me. I'm not an orphan. I'm a king's kid. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, God is good. God is good. Some powerful, powerful, powerful nuggets on being a father. Amen, amen. We would normally uh, come and give you some things, but we just are kind of just counting your hand right now. Just know that if you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ right now today, that your life will never, ever, ever be the same. And you just switched your destination from hell to heaven because the only way to go to heaven is to come through Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and be forgiven. Come on, give Jesus a big shout, you guys. God is good. Thank you so much, Pastor Harry. Just a powerful word for fathers. How many of you fathers got something out of that today? Amen. And just some powerful, powerful stuff. All right, at this time, so we're running out of time, I want to make sure that we handle some business real quick. It's time for us to invest in the kingdom of God. Come on, let's give Jesus a shout for that. It's time for your giving. If you are a visitor, we don't ask that you give unless you would like to. But if this is your home church, we would love for you to plant a seed right now as we do a many different things in our community and also in our world to take care of people and take care of those that are underserved. Amen. So we want you to get your offering ready, get your giving ready. If you're watching us online, there are four different ways to give. Uh, you can look at the bottom of your screen. We do reoccurring giving. My wife and I, we set it up, and, and we have a time. We know when we get paid and we know when we give, amen? And so we appreciate your seed right now. I want you to hold it up right now or hold your phone up right now, whatever way you're doing it. There's also text to give, and this is your gift to the kingdom of God, and we will take that and make sure we give the good news and give hope to people that are out there, amen? So let's pray. Father, we love you and we honor you. We give you all kind of praise and glory, and we thank you for that this seed, Father, right now will bring a harvest to those that are giving. We thank you for their generosity, and we thank you, Father, that you're going to be a blessing to those that don't have it and those that need it. We honor you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, give God a big shout. Giving is a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Uh, the Bible tells us it's better to give than to receive. Ushers, you can come forward, and they're going to just walk through and you can put it in the bucket there. Now, um, we told you before, and I want to thank you so, so much. Um, where are all the ladies at? Come on, where are the ladies at? So, so some of you know, we do a lot of different programs at the church. A lot of you are not familiar with the programs, but we do a program called Meals to Heal. And the last Sunday of every month, um, so that would be next Sunday, we're asking you to put some food in your trunk. We have a list that's available on our website and on our Facebook. And if you would do that and bring it, it'll be a wonderful blessing. We work with Pastor John. He has two houses in uh, Marino Valley and five houses for men. And so last week, the ladies brought seven containers of all kind of feminine and hygiene products. It's going to last them months. You guys literally donated thousands of dollars. These ladies are getting out of jail. These ladies are homeless, and they don't have the money to do that. And I want to thank you so much for your giving and providing. I didn't expect that much. That's probably going to last them three or four months. And then next Sunday, we also, okay, come on. You don't understand why I'm talking to y'all and not talking to him. 
Okay, so uh, next, the last Sunday of the month, so in between services, um, you put the food in your trunk, you want to pull over to Family Life, and what we want to do is make sure that they have food every single month. There are 62 beds, it's okay, there are 62 beds for the people that are homeless, and so we want to make sure that we provide food for them. Isn't that a wonderful blessing? How many of you know when somebody picks you up off the street, you don't have money to do that? And so we've been able to pick up from jail over 15,000 people. Isn't that huge? In the last two years. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful ministry, but they need things and they need stuff. So these are people that need a second chance. How many of you guys need a second chance? Come on, I know I do. And so your giving is a wonderful, wonderful blessing. And if you bring your food next week, we do it the last Sunday every month. It's going to really, really be tremendous, and it's going to help us. Brooke, I'm not going to do the last announcement, all right, for the, or for the sake of time. Go ahead. And remember, non-perishables. We only can receive non-perishables right now. So when you bring your canned goods and non-perishables. Now, I didn't want to end the service without saying this. I want to honor my husband, the father of my children. And because it, it is Father's Day, and I just want to let you know, you know, I appreciate and I love the man that you are, and you've always been a man of integrity and a man of good character. I appreciate the husband that you've become. Key word, become. Oh, no, you didn't start off like that. Uh, but I appreciate it after 20, almost 26 years now. Um, oh, no. <laughs> the, 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 the husband that you've become and that we stuck in there for all these years. And I appreciate the grandpa, the, 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 the um, papa and father uh, that you are. As you see, all the kids love him. I'm the spanker. He's, he's, the, he's the one that's fun. But um, I appreciate the father that you are and the grandfather that you are. Love you. Happy Father's Day. All right. Okay. So we're going to pray over our offering at this time. So um, just raise up your hand. Father, we just thank you, Father, for the opportunity for them to sow seed and for us to sow seed, Father God. We ask you, Lord, to bring back to them a hundredfold return, Father God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that it will go forth, the funds that we collected, to minister to those in need, Father God, and to bring life to the high desert, Father. We just give you all the glory and ask you, Lord, to bless those that gave, Father God, that they walk in divine health. Father, I thank you that no weapon formed against them shall prosper in the name of Jesus, and we give you all the glory for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now, we had an awesome guest speaker, Mr. Harry, our great friend. And we do have a product table back there. I want you to bless Mr. Salem. Go back there and check out his table. He has some awesome resources back there. I didn't get to see everything, but did you, did, did you bring Don't Kill Him, Let God Do It? Yes. Okay, that's a good book. And if you're married, that's a good book. Because, see, sometimes I want to kill him. I said, no, I'm just going to let God handle it, right? No. <laughs> anyway, but that's an awesome book. So go back there and uh, purchase some things off of uh, Minister Salem's uh, book table. We don't want him to leave with all that stuff he came with. Amen? Amen. All right. Can you all stand? And I'm going to ask you, if, if you have, uh, I know we didn't have outlines here, but even if you had an offering envelope, to pick that up and take it with you because we do have to clean and sanitize in between services. So um, I appreciate if you help us out in that way. All right? All right. Come on, let's give God another shout. We thank God so much today. So, Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for a safe trip home, Lord God. We thank you for the word that was deposited today in our hearts and in our lives. We ask you to bless every father that is here today, Father, and we thank you that everything that was deposited in their life will bring a harvest. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys, and we'll see you next week.